baseball season starts with a transfer of the Boston Braves to Milwaukee. The change of TPs brings a change of fortune. The Braves climb to second spot in the National League, and they improve their standings at the box office, too. At season's end, the St. Louis Browns make a change also. The Brownies move to Baltimore, take on the famed name of the Orioles, and hope the change will improve their play and business. Business, that's a horrid word in baseball. After months of deliberation, the Supreme Court rules that baseball is a sport, not a business. This means baseball is not subject to the antitrust laws. Back from the wars for the second time comes Ted Williams. Fifteen months as a Marine jet pilot in Korea did not dim his batting eye. He appears in 37 games for the Boston Red Sox, bats 407. But it was a case of too much, too late. Nothing stops the New York Yankees from winning a record fifth American League pennant in a row. And Casey Stingle led them to a record-shattering fifth consecutive world title, a mark that even the great John McGraw and Joe McCarthy failed to achieve. On paper, the Brooklyn Dodgers were favored, but the experts picked the Yanks because of the intangibles. And some tangibles like pitchers, Whitey Ford, Vic Reichie, Eddie Lopat, the man who had the American League best earned run average, and rubber-armed Allie Reynolds. Mickey Mantle, second from right, hit a grand slammer in the fifth game, the third man in history to do that. Yogi Berra, along with outfielder Gene Woodling and Mantle, were mainstays in the Yankee sweep, but the man who made the difference in the series was second baseman Billy Martin. The Dodger pitchers just could not get Casey's boy out. The Dodgers went into the series seeking their first win in seven tries, but again, it's wait until next year. They had a moment of glory when Carl Erskine struck out 14 Yanks to set a new series record. But there was no glory for Russ Meyer and Clem Labine. Martin hit the series winning single off Labine. Mantle hit his grand slammer off Meyer. But the Dodgers had their share of other honors. Roy Campanella, most valuable player in the league. Carl Ferrillo won the league batting title. His dramatic homer in the ninth tied the last game. But for higher hopes, it was wait until next year. And things will be different next year, especially for Charlie Dressen, because Walter Alston will manage the Dodgers. Owner Walter O'Malley and Dressen, friendly here, didn't see eye to eye at season's end. Dressen wanted a three-year contract. He was fired, returned to his old job at Oakland. <laughs> Here are the first baseball shots of the season as our cameraman hit the spring training camps. Spring is in the air and so are baseballs. Manager Lou Boudreau outlined some of his plans for the Boston Red Sox before sending them out to drill at Sarasota, Florida. Pitching has been a Red Sox weakness for years and may continue to plague them. Their chief hopes are Mel Parnell, Sid Hudson, formerly of Washington, and their relief ace, Ellis Kinder. A perennial pennant favorite in past years, the Sox now are in the process of rebuilding. They bow to no team at third base, manned by George Kell, seen here giving fielding tips to Bill Consolo. Dick Gernert and Harry Aganis, Boston U football star, are first base candidates. The eccentric Jim Pearsall is practicing in the outfield. The Red Sox never lack for hitting strength and probably will get plenty of base hits from Bill Goodman, Gernert, a product of Temple University, and the redoubtable Cal. At Lakeland, Florida, Detroit faces a big task after finishing last in the American League for the first time in history. Tiger pitching slipped badly last season, but the club has acquired Ned Garver from the Browns. Detroit should get some victories out of Hal Newhauser. And has good potentials in Ted Gray. And Art Hauteman, a hard luck guy. The Tiger infield was a weak sector last season, and since the brilliant George Kell was traded to Boston, Gerald Pretty at second base is its anchor. 
Harvey Kewen, who jumped from the Wisconsin campus to the Tigers in one season, is a shortstop candidate, and the club hopes he and Pretty will give them a strong keystone defense. In Orlando, Florida, owner Clark Griffith, one of baseball's patriarchs, and manager Bucky Harris congratulate the Washington Senators on a good showing last year and predict still better things. The Senators surprised by running in the first division for months before finishing fifth. That's the way to hit them. The Senators developed surprising pitching strength, including a comeback by former Yankee Spec Shea. Bob Porterfield, also from the Yanks, proved very tough. The Senators recently got southpaw Chuck Stobbs from the Red Sox. Their rookie hopes include Bunky Stewart from Chattanooga and Sonny Nixon. The Senators need batting punch, but they have a robust stickman in long ball hitter Mickey Vernon. They hope for a comeback by Ken Wood and have a potential star in Jackie Jensen. The Browns, training in San Bernardino, California, have played second fiddle to the Cardinals in St. Louis for many years. But owner Bill Beck has made up his mind to stop that sort of thing. Here are his pitchers practicing holding runners close to the bases. The Browns got fireballer Virgil Trucks from Detroit last winter, but when you think of Brownie pitching, you just naturally think of old Satch Page. How old? Nobody knows, and maybe that includes Satch himself but he's still mighty stingy with runs. This is slow motion, but then so is practically every move old Satch makes. Vic Wirtz left from the Tigers, and Dick Kokos are expected to supply brownie punch. Here's Wirtz. And Kokos. Hard-hitting Roy Seavers may be on first base. Coach Harry Brookeen and others hope for great deeds from rookie shortstop Bill Hunter and second baseman Bob Young. There's lots of mending to be done at Bradenton, camp of the Boston Braves, who crumbled to a seventh place finish in the National League. This is the job of the Board of Strategy. Coaches Bob Keeley, Johnny Cooney, Bucky Walter, and manager Charlie Grimm. The once powerful Braves pitching staff has come apart at the seams, but still has the great left-hander Warren Spahn. Jimmy Wilson won 12 games last year. Max Surcout also won 12, and the Braves hope this will be the year for their famous bonus baby, Johnny Antonelli. One of the prize prospects is Jim Pendleton, infielder obtained from Brooklyn in the same deal that brought Andy Papko. Eva St. Clair may help the catching staff. And the Braves have speed merchant Sam Jethro and a possible power-hitting first baseman in George Crow. There's plenty of optimism in Tampa, Florida, as manager Rogers Hornsby leads the Cincinnati Reds out and hopes to lead them out of the wilderness of the National League Second Division. The once stern Roger has been lenient this spring, but tolerates no foolishness on the field. Cincinnati has always depended heavily on its pitchers, who haven't borne up lately. But Kenny Raffensperger pitched six shutouts last season. Herman Wehmeyer was not as effective as formerly. But Harry Perkowski showed a lot of promise. As the Reds work, they're watched with interest by coach Buster Mills, National League president Warren Giles, manager Hornsby, and coach Ford Garrison. In Pepper games, first baseman Ted Klazuski muffles his power. Veteran catcher Andy Semenik shows Hobie Landry how to cock his arm for throwing to bases. Willard Marshall hit well for the Reds last season. Klazuski can hit him a mile. Semenik is a long ball threat, and Roy McMillan a flashy shortstop. Here's a breath of the national pastime from Havana, Cuba, where the Pittsburgh Pirates are training under a new manager, Fred Haney, with hopes of vacating the National League cellar. The board of strategy includes Sam Naren, John Fitzpatrick, Bill Posdell, 
new manager Haney and Clyde Sukhavoy. The Pirates need pitching and hope to get some from Bill McDonald, just out of the Army, and Johnny Lindell, former Yankee power hitter, trying for a comeback on the mound. Plenty of interest centers on Vic Genowitz, the Ohio State football great, who forsook the gridiron to try for a big league baseball berth as a Pittsburgh catcher. Here's former Dodger outfielder Cal Abrams and Dan O'Connell, who broke in like a hitter last year. The famed George Sisler gives Janowitz some batting tips, but the Pirates' big gun, Ralph Kiner, may be traded elsewhere. Big league ball players take a flyer at golf before spring training in Florida, and Johnny Lindell, former Yankee outfielder, tells Russ Meyer of the Phillies how he hopes to come back as a Pittsburgh pitcher. Ed Lopat, Yankee southpaw, famous for his control, finds he's just a little off the beam at this stage of the season. But Steady Eddie seems to be pretty sharp with his putter. Yogi Berra, colorful Yankee catcher, demonstrates his putting stroke under the watchful eye of Jimmy Dykes, manager of the Philadelphia Athletics. Dykes seems to think Yogi's technique is okay. Jim Hearn, New York Giants pitcher, is one of the best golfers in baseball ranks. Here's Ewell Blackwell trying for a comeback with the Yanks this season. Do you recognize this stance? It's Stan the Man Musial, the Cardinals' great star. Little Phil Rizzuto of the Yankees, one of the top shortstops in baseball history. And the winner? A man who's used to winning. Allie Reynolds, star pitcher of the world champion Yankees. Is heard throughout the sunny south once again as the major leaguers begin to work the kinks out of their muscles for the opening of the baseball season. Telesports cameras are touring the camps to bring you all the stories straight from these spring training sites. Today we're going to take a look at some of the promising rookies who may be making the headlines when the regular season begins. It's baseball time once again as the big league clubs are earnestly conditioning themselves for another season of top flight play. Each year, rookies play a major role in the success of many clubs. This year possibly will be no exception. Brooklyn Dodger manager Charlie Dressen has two top yearlings and lanky Don Hook voted the best third baseman in the International League while at Montreal last year. Diminutive shortstop Don Zimmer, a 310 hitter at Mobile. Both are excellent prospects. Things are looking bright for manager Chuck Dressen and crew as they quest their second straight flag. At St. Petersburg, Florida, St. Louis Cardinal manager Eddie Stanky is extremely high on 21-year-old first baseman Neil Hertwick. An outstanding glove man, the left-swinging native of St. Louis, batted in 92 runs for Omaha last year while hitting 285. Another top Redbird freshman is fleet-footed outfielder Eldon Rip Repulski, a right-handed power hitter who hit 296 for Rochester last year. Rip can run the 100 in 10 seconds flat, which is really a feat for a muscular 195-pounder. The Cincinnati Reds drilling daily at Tampa, Florida, are counting heavily on rookie center fielder Jim Greengrass. Jim came up late last season from Beaumont and batted 309 in 18 games for the Rhinelanders. This boy will bear watching. Another red leg recruit is unheralded George Bailey. Manager Rogers Hornsby likes the spunk of this youngster and says that if early indications mean anything, Bailey could win the number two catching spot behind veteran Andy Semenik. Among the outfield candidates, Hornsby also likes 23-year-old Nino Escalera, a native of Puerto Rico. Escalera has had four brilliant minor league seasons and comes to the Reds from Toledo. The big question in the Philadelphia Athletics camp at West Palm Beach is pitching. Can they comb the rookie crop for another top hurler? Well, here's Len Matarazzo, winner of 22 at Fayetteville last year, and Charlie Bishop up for another try from Ottawa. Southpaw Alex Kellner's brother Walt just returned from the Army. Left-hander Frank Fenovich, who had a brief fling with Cincinnati in 1949. Big Ed Monahan, winner of 17 for Jacksonville last season. Monahan is only 23 years old and has a bright future. Right-hander Tom Tyson is another promising young hurler. 
Burley Ed Rabsack is a strikeout artist from Lincoln, Nebraska, and Southpaw Dick Rosek, used sparingly at Cleveland last year, could be manager Jimmy Dykes, ace in the hole. Swinging to Orlando, the Washington Senators believe they have a real find in catcher Les Peden. Standing 6'2 and weighing 212 pounds, Peden had a great season with Los Angeles last year. On the hill, rookie Frank Zeitz looks promising. An 18-game winner in the Southern Association last year, Zeitz is a typical example of the many anxious rookies who are battling for fame and fortune at the big league training sites. At Bradenton, Florida, the 1953 edition of the Boston Braves is busy at the task of conditioning for another National League drive. Mixing workouts with exhibition games, the tribe is rounding into great shape. As he starts his first full season, manager Charlie Grimm is confident that the Braves pitchers led by left-hander Warren Spahn will be the key to the team's success. Spahn will be aiming for 20 wins this year after missing the charm circle last season. Relief ace Lou Burdett is in top shape and says his arm feels great. The six foot two inch, 180 pound native of West Virginia has been a blessing for manager Grimm. Another promising hurler on the Brave roster is six foot eight inch Gene Conley. This strapping youngster gave up a pro basketball career to devote full time to baseball. At Milwaukee last year, he fashioned an 11-1 and four lost mark. The big story in the Brave camp so far has been the return from military service of Johnny Antonelli. The young bonus southpaw, shown with pitching coach Bucky Walters, shows the proper grip for the fastball as well as the curve. The Braves are hoping that this will be Johnny's year for full-fledged stardom. Veteran catcher Walker Cooper may share backstopping chores with Del Crandall. A 10-year man, Coop is raring to go, but he'll have plenty of opposition from Ebba St. Clair, the switch-hitting sophomore who's anxious to win a starting berth. In the infield, newcomer Joe Adcock, secured in a trade with Cincinnati, looks as fit as a fiddle. He'll be extremely valuable to the Braves as either an outfielder or a first baseman. Manager Grimm, shown testing Ed Cox fielding, is giving Joe a full try at first base since Earl Torgerson has left the scene. He'll have a real battle with George Crow for the job, and it'll be interesting to see who wins the berth. At the Keystone sack, 25-year-old Jack Dittmer looks mighty good. A smooth fielder, Dittmer batted a booming 356 at Milwaukee last year. He's also a capable pivot man on the double play. Eddie Matthews, one of the top freshmen in the National League last year, will be back at third base. He clouded no less than 25 home runs in his rookie season. At shortstop smooth fielding, Johnny Logan is endeavoring to win the regular berth. Logan hit 283 in 117 games last year. In the outfield, Charlie Grimm can call on the veteran Sid Gordon, a real hustler. Sid is a fixture in Beantown. Sam Jethro, the deer-footed center fielder, is back, and his valuable switch hitting will aid no end. While Bob Thorpe could make the grade in right field. With a squad like this on hand, is it any wonder that manager Charlie Grimm is shouting for joy? Hello, this is Bill Cunningham down at Braden, Florida, the training camp of the Boston Braves. And a good, hot, warm, blistering day to wish you all were here. Standing right beside me is one of the greatest prospects in baseball. This is Eddie Matthews of the Braves, the third baseman, who last year as a freshman really tore the National League apart. He's the greatest home run hitter to come into the National League since Ralph Kiner. And now the young, <laughs> the young <laughs> fellow's going, going into his sophomore year. And are you afraid of the, the sophomore jinx, Eddie, or not? After that build-up, I'm bound to be. <laughs> no, really, how do you go? How do you feel? How do you no, feel? I, I believe that sophomore jinx pertains to these fellows that hit uh, these fantastic figures, 346 and 350, and then they're bound to come down in the second year. But uh, since I only hit about 242, I, I can't go much lower. I'm 242, but how many home runs? 26, wasn't it? I had 25 home runs. 25 home runs. Well, that's pretty good production. How do you feel? How are you working out? I feel uh, very good. I'm a lot more confident down here than I was last year, and... Uh, Taking my time, I feel at 
I'm going to relax the spring training and uh, try and hit my peak when the season starts. Well, what do you think of the, of the new members of the team? I mean, the team looks better to you, I assume. Oh, definitely. The team has a lot of spirit, and these trades we've made during the winter, I believe, will help us tremendously. They tell me this is a happy ball club. If they're singing in the showers, and they had a, used to have a tough time getting you guys to get out of the clubhouse and go out in the diamond. Now they have a tough time getting you in orbit. Is that right? Yeah, we have a very good spirit in the club. What I saw today, uh, they stayed out there a long time. This is the first uh, inter-squad game was played today, and I want to tell you it went on for hours. They tell me we were giving a door prize to somebody said to find out what the score was. Oh, How did you hit him today? I hit him straight up. <laughs> no, I didn't do too good today. Uh, but I wasn't worried. I feel I'll come around. It takes time. Well, you um, think the trades and the deals really greatly strengthened the club. And well, you look for a much better year, right? I really do. I think we've got a sleeper cub here, like Charlie said a while ago. And uh, I'm looking forward to good things this year. How about the power of that young fellow, fellow Pendleton Charlie oh, and I were talking he about? He looks good. He really yeah. pulled a couple of balls. He's there, a strong boy. Well, uh... I don't know what else to say, except we all wish you luck. We're all pulling for you, and we hope that you go clear through and break Heiner's and Ruth's and everybody else's right. Thank you very much, Eddie Matthews, the boss. Thank you. With spring training in full swing, those amazing A's are settling down to some heavy-duty training, and manager Jimmy Dykes is more than pleased with the way the team is progressing. Jimmy points with pride to a core of pitchers who could comprise one of baseball's finer staffs. So suppose we take a look at the boys, who are most likely to draw the starting assignments. Here's Carl Scheib, the right-handed flinger who was used on the relief start basis in 1952. Carl's 11-7 record was mighty impressive, and this season, manager Dykes has him slated for full-time duties. Alex Keller, the big left-hander, who picked up 12 wins last year, is currently giving promise of greater things to come. Bobby Shantz, the incomparable welterweight southpaw, reports his left forearm, which was broken last September, has completely mended, and he's ready to take up where he left off. Harry Bird, who was voted 1952's American League Rookie of the Year, gained control and began to mow him down last year, and should be good for 20 victories this season. Maury Martin, who was sidelined last May because of a broken finger, completes a potent mound quintet. Shantz claims that the A's could have won the pennant last year if Maury had been in action. The A's pitching looks more than adequate, but of course a lot will depend on their top tosser, Bobby Shantz, shown here with battery mate Joe Astroff. Standing five feet six and weighing less than 140 pounds, Bobby is without question one of the greatest hurlers in the game today. Joe Astroff, the man who catches while Bobby tosses, gave us a few tips on why Bobby is so outstanding. He can get any pitch he throws over the plate, and he throws them all. A knuckler, a sneaky fastball, a curve, a screwball, all of them. Bobby has one of the best curves in the majors, and he can throw it from three positions. Overhand, three quarters, and sidearm. He can also throw his curve at varying speeds. He's got the fast one, the real good sharp breaking curve from over the top, and the slow curve that you can't wait for it to get to the plate. Another powerful factor in the little guy's success is that he throws everything for a strike and he's always setting the batter up for a certain pitch. Along with that, he's one of the best fielding pitchers in the league. He's so quick that it's almost impossible to get a line drive through the middle of the diamond. Yes, Joe Astroff is mighty glad that Philadelphia's leading citizen will again be chucking him in to his padded mitt. Beyond the starting five, the A's resourceful pilot has at least six others who might be figured to stick around. And of those remaining pitchers, it's almost a certainty that Bobo Newsom, the ageless traveler of the big leagues, will once more be ready for the relief chores and starting spots. Bobo claims he's in the best of shape of his long and colorful career, which incidentally dates back to 1929. And if we can rely on Bobo's word, the A's hurling corps is ready to blaze a path through all competition. Yes, the little round man, manager Jimmy Dykes, is quite happy with his pitching staff. And although his band of twirlers may not have everything, they have more than enough to make an A's fan optimistic. The Detroit Tigers' Prince Hal Newhouser, after a mediocre 52 season, is ready to embark on his 14th year as a Detroit hurler. Newhouser had a sore arm over the past two years and is now striving to recapture the stuff that once classified him as one of the American League's greatest chuckers. Brooklyn's Ralph Branca is another of yesterday's heroes trying the comeback trail. The Branca story is an old one at Brooklyn, where he never has been able to regain...
Larry Jansen of the New York Giants reports a complete cure of the back ailment that bothered him last season. In his last spring training outing, Larry worked five innings and pitched to only 15 batters. A good indication that Larry has regained the form that made him one of the truly fine pitchers in baseball. Pittsburgh's Johnny Lindell is a completely different case. Johnny makes his return to the majors after a 24-9 and season at Hollywood. Although he was a pitcher in the Yankee farm system, he was an outfielder during most of his long big league career. Now 36, Johnny will attempt to make the grade as a big league hurler. Plagued by injuries the past two seasons, the Milwaukee Braves' Vern Bickford is working hard toward the fame he once held as one of the National League's top hurlers. Vern is confident that this season will be a return to his 1949 showing that saw him win 19 games. Former St. Louis Brown hurler Ned Garver, who was a 20-game winner in 1951, reports his ailing arm is completely cured. And from the way Ned is pitching this spring, the 27-year-old Ohioan should come pretty close to that 20-game circle for the Detroit Tigers. Jerry Pretty's case hinges on whether or not his leg responds to the current schedule of spring training activity. Jerry was playing great ball for the Detroit Tigers until injured. Yes, fans, Jerry and all of yesterday's heroes will be in there fighting for membership in the Major League's Comeback Club. Once again, firmly in the sports headlines, and the biggest story of the week is the scramble going on among the National League champion Dodgers, both rookies and regulars for the starting infield positions. Let's look over the situation. In the Brooklyn Dodgers training camp at Vero Beach, Florida, the big question concerns the infield situation. Many top flight rookies are pushing the regulars for their jobs. Manager Charlie Dressen is happy over the newly found competition, which includes freshman third base candidate Don Hope, who batted 293 for Montreal last year, and shortstop Don Zimmer, a 310 swatter at Mobile. Dressen has been pleased with the play of both of these youngsters and expects big things from them this season. Though Hulk is a better than adequate hitter, his speed and smooth defensive play are his best assets. International League President Frank Shaughnessy last year tabbed him the league's finest third baseman in the past 10 years. Zimmer is the heir apparent to Pee Wee Reese's shortstop job at Mobile. Don was a superb fielder and rated a berth on the league's all-star team. First baseman Wayne Bellardi, up from Fort Worth, is really hustling to stay with the Dodgers. Pictured with catcher Roy Campanella, Bellardi works hard to perfect the first baseman to pitcher covering first play, which is one of the toughest a first sacker has to make. Timing is the big factor here as both the pitcher and the ball should arrive at the bag simultaneously. As for his hitting ability, Wayne batted 302 in the Texas League last season and belted 20 round trippers. Only 22 years old, he has a bright future ahead of him. Here's infielder Bobby Morgan on the left with Don Zimmer and manager Dressen. Morgan, an all-around utility man with the Dodgers last season, is bidding for a regular job. And if his excellent hitting in spring training games is any indication, Bobby may make it. All-time Dodger ace Pee Wee Reese is back for another campaign. Reese will again captain the team from his shortstop post. But World Series star and top third baseman Billy Cox, according to Dressen, will be shifted into the role of utility infielder. The change is designed to find a spot for Junior Gilliam, a great infield prospect from Montreal. Jackie Robinson, pictured here limbering up his arm, would then be forced to move elsewhere and may wind up on third base. In the Grapefruit League games thus far, Robbie has played at third and first as well as the Keystone sack. Whatever the final outcome, you can be sure that Jackie and his big bat will be located somewhere in the starting lineup come opening day. Returning to the initial sack for the flock is muscular Gil Hodges, the Hoosier from Indiana, who belted 32 round trippers last year. By learning to hit to right field instead of pulling the ball all the time, Gill expects to add many points to his batting average. Manager Dressen feels that Hodges' eagerness to learn is the typical of the many Dodger players who are battling for jobs. Even though they are defending league champions, hustle is still the team's byword.
This is the tale of two cities which spent an entire weekend under the delusion that they had finally become big league. Here is Baltimore, which had a 48-hour fling at the big time, under the erroneous impression that its stadium would house the American League Brown shifted from St. Louis. But the fans, and especially Brownie owner Bill Veck, failed to count on the whims of Major League Baseball. At a last-ditch session, the club owners killed the entire plan, claiming that there was not sufficient time between now and opening day to shift the franchise. The surprise move throws confusion into Baltimore's plans to expand the stadium from a 40,000 capacity to 62,500. Also canceled out are the long hours of conferences between civic and baseball officials. Meetings like this one between Beck, with open collar as usual, and Baltimore's Mayor D'Alessandro. But they were confident their efforts would bring replacement of the International League Orioles with a big league team, confidence which is reflected in statements such as these. Uh, and incidentally, I'd like to commend Mr. Anderson and his committee. Uh, the mayor, of course, he, he's uh, been... What does the mayor do, Mr. Bankman? He's been stage managing this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, Got to put you on the spot, Mr. Mayor. You think Baltimore's going to get a major league team? I not only think we're going to get a major league team, I'm for winning the pennant already. <laughs> Thank you. At the same time, Milwaukee was just as confident it would open the coming season as a big league city. With Baltimore apparently assured of an American League team, Milwaukee was all set to receive the Boston Braves. The Wisconsin metropolis has a brand new ballpark which compares favorably with almost any in the major leagues. It holds about 33,000, and here Milwaukee fans were all set to root for Warren Spahn, Sid Gordon, and other Brave stars, certain they would be performing here. So certain was Milwaukee of the transfer, Mayor Frank Zeidler with Fred Miller here welcomes Joe Carnes, Braves executive vice president. Oh, Joe, I'm glad to see that the Braves could uh, find their way to come into Milwaukee this season. I certainly think that this, more than anything else, justifies the community investment in this uh, establishment, this wonderful new stadium, and we certainly want to welcome you. Now, I want to give you something here that shows you that we really mean business. One of these keys here opens the city hall. This, all, this key, I think, opens the stadium. There you are. Uh, All right. Do you have a key to the city vault, too, Mr. Mayor? <laughs> I wanted to say that, that we're uh, very happy in coming to Milwaukee. And uh, I think that uh, uh, I should do and to uh, the uh, uh, Greater Milwaukee Committee and the uh, County Park Commission and everyone that you've all shown great foresight in building this stadium. If this stadium had not been built, this uh, is one of the finest structures in the country of its kind. And had this not been built, there's no question the Braves would not be opening the season here this year. But baseball magnets move slowly, if ever. And after the leagues had met, it proved only a dream after all. We don't know if this is a repeat of the last World Series or a preview of the next, but it's the New York Yankees and Brooklyn Dodgers meeting in Miami. And there goes Billy Cox to first on a pop fly single for Brooklyn in the third. Pee Wee Reese gets a walk from Yankee rookie Bob Weisler. And Duke Snyder is still belting the Yanks. His single through the middle scores Cox with a game's first run. In the top of the fourth, Mickey Mantle walks after Irv Noren has drawn a base on balls. Gene Woodling measures the new Brooklyn pitcher after Noren has already scored, and Gene delivers a typical Yankee wallop, a home run over the scoreboard. The blow sends Mantle jogging over the plate in front of Woodling, and the Yankees go out in front, three to one. later, Mantle gets a look at Ed Roebuck, Brooklyn rookie, who's shown up pretty well in training so far. Mickey gives Roebuck his stamp of approval by lashing a homer over the left field fence. With Bob serve already on the pass with a base on balls, this means two more runs and the Yanks lead five to one. In 
in the same inning, the Dodgers stir up some fun. With the bases full, Roy Campanella's shot gets away from Billy Martin. One run scores, and the bases are still full. Gil Hodges gets a hold of one. It has the distance, but just goes foul. Johnny Sane decides Hodges won't get that pitch again, and he doesn't. Hodges strikes out. That puts it up to Carl Perillo. Carl wraps to Phil Rizzuto. It's a double play, and the Yanks win easily, eight to three. Opening day is always a big day, but here's the most historic opening in 50 years. Big League Baseball comes back to Milwaukee with the Braves taking on the St. Louis Cardinals. About 36,000 jam Milwaukee's new park and thousands more are turned away. The first official big league hit in the new park is Joe Adcock's single for the Braves in the second inning, and a very legitimate base hit. Del Crandall follows with a dribbler down the third baseline. Ray Jablonski hurries the throw, and there it goes past first. Adcock pedals around with the first run of the game for the Braves. Watch the relay. A good one would have had him. In the fifth, Warren Spahn's pickoff throw to first gets away, and Enos Slaughter of the Cards takes second base. Enos got on with a walk. Spahn's next problem is Jablonski, and the rookie comes through with a clean single. Slaughter scores easily, and the game is tied up one and one. Just when it looks like the Braves have it all wrapped up with two out in the ninth, Peanuts Lowry pinch hits a long double to left center. And Harvey Haddix, running for Jablonski, checks in with a Cardinals run, sending it into extra inning. Now Jerry Staley pitches to Bill Bruton in the 10th, and the Milwaukee rookie hits it right on the nose. It skips off Slaughter's glove over the low wire fence, but the umpire signal a ground rule double, and Bruton pulls up at third. Now what? The ruling brings manager Charlie Grimm out on the run, and Grimm claims a home run, and for once, a manager wins an argument from an umpire. Bruton scores the run that breaks up the game, and Milwaukee makes the great day greater, winning three to two. Well, this looks familiar. My old buddy turning out for another afternoon of the national pastime. The Yankees are taking on the Washington Senators, but the real angle on this game is Whitey Ford, who's making his first start since he won the last game of the 1950 World Series from the Phillies. Whitey can win this year, the Yanks will breeze in. Ford is tagged for a single by Jackie Jensen to lead off the Washington fourth inning. And that brings Whitey up against a rough customer, Mickey Vernon. And he blasts one right down the first baseline, and the ball hops right over the railing for a ground rule double. Jackie Jensen pulls in the third. The umpire tells him that's as far as he can go. With one out, Pete Reynolds pushes a single to left center, and the Senators break the ice with two runs. Notice the slide. Always playing safe. That's good old Vernon. Whitey's in another jam after Vernon walks in the sixth and Reynolds hits a low sinking fly to center. And now watch Mickey Mantle make a fine mechanical one-handed catch off his shoe tops. And then instinctively, he makes the right play with a throw on the run to double Vernon off first base. Doing what comes naturally. The Yanks haven't been able to do a thing with Al Seam up to now, but Andy Carey does something in the sixth. Andy tags one, and there it goes into the right field seats, the first run of the game for the Yankees, and Andy's first major league home run, by the way, a thrill he'll never forget, and Washington still leads, however, two to one. Now it's the last of the ninth, and Hank Barr bloops a hit in the right after Mickey Mantle walks. Two on, nobody out. Now here's some real strategy. Gene Woodling has fouled off two, trying to bunt. Now he takes a healthy cut, the ball takes off, and it's goodbye ball game as far as Washington is concerned. 
That home run strategy always pays off. Mantle and Bowers score ahead of him, and once more that old Yankee power has exploded in a pitcher's face. The Yankees win again, four to two. Major League Baseball is already producing a full measure of thrills for the fans across the nation. There's been great hitting and great pitching in both leagues. So let's take a swing around the circuit and see who hit the headlines in baseball this week. As the Major League season begins to warm up, the quality of play in both the junior and senior circuits has been outstanding. Leading the way for the world champion New York Yankees is bustling outfielder Gene Woodling, who is currently pacing the American League in batting with a 472 mark. Gene played a Frank Merriwell role for New York last Saturday as his ninth inning three-run homer defeated the visiting Washington Senators. Southpaw Eddie Lopat has been the shining light on the mound for the Red Hot Bronx Bombers. Eddie captured his first two mound decisions and it looks as though this left-handed dart thrower is headed for a banner year the likes of his 21-9 mark of 1951. Bobby Lemon of the Cleveland Indians has gone the route in his three starting assignments and his one loss log reads three victories, no defeats. One of the top hurling marks in the league. Facing the Chicago White Sox, their early surge has been Minnie Minoso, the fleet-footed fly chaser who is currently batting 314. Minnie has been clouding the long ball as his teammate Jim Rivera, whose daring base running won several vital games for the Pale Holes this year. The Philadelphia Athletics shorthanded center fielder Dave Philly has been a revelation for manager Jimmy Dykes. At the plate, Dave, shown belting along double, hit safely in his first 10 games and collected an overall total of 20 hits for 47 times at bat to give him a scintillating 426 batting average. Facing the American League in circuit clouts is Dick Gurnett, the 23-year-old Boston Red Sox first baseman. Dick has pulled four round trippers so far, with two of them coming in consecutive times at bat against the Washington Senators. A real surprise of the early play has been the stick work of the Detroit Tigers shortstop and leadoff man, Harvey Keene, who is batting 333 and has sparkled in the field. He came up from Davenport near the end of last season and batted 325 for the Bengals in 19 games. It appears that this 22-year-old youngster is starting off in 1953 exactly the way he concluded the 52 season. The important runs batted in column in the junior circuit is being paced by big Tiger first baseman Walt Dropo. Walt has thumped across 11 runs in 13 games. He possesses one of the most powerful pair of wrists in baseball and seems intent on recapturing the RBI title which was his in 1950 while he played with the Boston Red Sox. The Milwaukee Braves' great third baseman Eddie Matthews with six home runs is in complete charge of that department in the National League. Eddie blasted 25 round trippers in his freshman season last year. Brooklyn Dodger backstop Roy Campanella leads the senior circuit in RBIs with 18. The Philadelphia born slugger also possesses a 3.57 mark at the plate and a total of four home runs through Sunday's games. News in the major leagues during the past week was the no hitter pitched by the St. Louis Browns rookie Bobo Holloman in his first major league start. We're going to hear from Bobo about that a little later. But first, let's round up the news in both major leagues. With the big league races now about a month old, the standings find Cleveland and Brooklyn on top. Brooklyn catcher Roy Campanella's play gave the Brooks a vital series win over Philadelphia. In the rubber game, Campy drove in all five runs in a 5 nothing victory. He now paces the big leagues in homers with 10 and RBIs with 38. Muscular Dodger first sacker Gil Hodges socked his 140th major league homer this week, which is a new all-time Dodger high. 23-year-old Dodger right-hander Billy Lowe shut out the Phillies with only six hits on Sunday for his fourth victory. The surprising Pittsburgh Pirates are only five and a half games behind Brooklyn. Ralph Kiner's two-run homer was enough to beat the Giants 2-0 on Saturday. Red-hot Pirate rookie Carlos Bernier recently tied a modern major league record with three triples in one game. Watch Carlos as he legs out an infield single against the Milwaukee Braves. New York Giants ace reliever Hoyt Wilhelm pitching in 14 of the Giants' first 22 games has allowed no earned runs in 27 innings. 
Milwaukee's little Don Little, making his first major league start, tossed a brilliant two-hitter to beat the Chicago Cubs. The victory put the third-place Braves only one and a half games from first place. Brave shortstop Johnny Logan had three hits, including a homer, and handled 18 chances flawlessly as the Braves took a doubleheader from the Cubs on Sunday. In the American League, Lou Boudreau has his Boston Red Sox only three games behind league-leading Cleveland. One of the main reasons is bustling Billy Goodman, who belted an 11th inning home run to edge the New York Yankees 2-1 last Friday. On Sunday, Billy suffered a bad muscle strain in the Red Sox 7-4 loss to New York, and he'll be out for a few days. Red Sox southpaw Pell-Mell Parnell continued his undefeated pace this week by curving the Chicago White Sox into submission 5-1. His record is now 4-0. In third place are the Chicago White Sox. Star shortstop Chico Carrascal garnered a double and two singles and drove in four tallies in the 7-2 White Sox victory over the Detroit Tigers on Friday. Raw-boned Washington right-hander Bob Porterfield faced only 27 men in registering an 8-0 one-hit victory over Philadelphia. This is the third time in the history of the majors that a pitcher has faced only 27 men in a full game. Nat outfielder Clyde the Clutch Falmer, along with Hurler Porterfield, were the big guns at the plate in the Senators' four-game sweep. Now let's get back to St. Louis and their fabulous rookie, Bobo Holloman. How do you do, friends? This is Bill Durney speaking to you, the traveling secretary of the St. Louis Browns baseball team of St. Louis, Missouri. As many of you undoubtedly know, a short time ago, the baseball world was electrified when a rookie pitcher pitching his first major league game pitched a no-hit ball game against the Philadelphia Athletics in St. Louis. That rookie was Alva Lee Holloman, better known to sports followers as Bobo Holloman. A 27-year-old fellow who had quite a record in the minor leagues of baseball last year, where at Syracuse he won 16 ball games and lost seven, and then went down to the Puerto Rico League during the winter months, and in working there in Puerto Rico, he amassed a total of about 20 victories. So last year for his efforts, he had about 36 wins. This was his first start in the Major Leagues of Baseball, and Bobo came through with a no-hit performance. The first time in the history of modern-day baseball that this feat has been accomplished. We'd like to move down here to meet Bobo Holloman. Bobo, uh, come over here to the microphone a moment, if you will. Well, friends, we'd like for you now to meet this sensational young rookie of baseball, fellow who probably had the greatest thrill that any man's ever had in the annals of Major League Baseball. Bobo, we're real happy to bring you up here to the microphone to visit with you a moment about uh, your, uh, your great uh, day and a great night in baseball. How did that no-hitter feel, Bobo? Well, I can't describe it, Bill. It's one of the most wonderful feelings I think I've ever had. Were you kind of nervous? Well, no, I didn't get nervous till right there at the ninth inning. And the uh, first hitter and the second hitter, I was all right, but the, the third hitter that I got him out, I was plenty nervous. Is that right? Well, I noticed uh, in the ninth inning there, uh, your catcher, Les Moss, uh, made a couple or three trips out to the mound, and, and uh, Harry Breen, the pitching coach, and uh, fellows like Babe Martin, who have helped you a lot, Bobo, since you've been up in the, in the major leagues with your, with your pitching. They were all kind of holding thumbs for you, but all trying to settle you down a little bit, weren't they? Yeah, they, they've done a remarkable job. What, what, do you remember what Les Moss said when he walked out? Yeah, he came out there and said that uh, you look kind of white. <laughs> <laughs> says you're wiping sweat, but ain't no sweat there. <laughs> he just, he just wanted to get me laughing, I guess. I see. Calm me down. Well, you, you had walked a couple of men, and, and the situation was kind of precarious, particularly when yeah. Eddie Robinson came up to the, to the plate there. Certainly was. Did, uh, th did you have any thrill as far as he was concerned? Remember that ball he fouled down the right field line? That happened so quick. It, when I turned around, the ball was just going out in the outfield. And, uh, I mean, down the right field foul line. So that was over before I had time to think about that one. And I'll tell you, Vic Wirtz never caught a fly ball that looked any better, did he? <laughs> he said, that, he said, that 27th out. Well, uh, thank you, Bobo, a lot, and a lot of good luck to you. Thank you very much. Washington Senators moved into the limelight with a four-game sweep over the Philadelphia Athletics last weekend. Let's watch them in action in the second game of that series. The A's Alex Kellner towed the rubber against the Nats in the second game, and he found the going just as rough as in the 10-7 defeat the Nats had handed Bobby Shantz the previous night. Walt Masterson was manager Bucky Harris's choice, and the 32-year-old right-hander was right up to par as he went gunning for his second triumph of the season. The 
Senators also boast a powerful hitting attack. Jackie Jensen is starting to hit his stride. And in the four-game series, the 26-year-old youngster collected five hits, including a four-bagger, to boost his average to 304. Jim Busby has also started to hit his stride. In the final game against the A's last Sunday, Jim blasted a four-bagger and in the four-game series collected seven hits to keep his average above the 300 mark. In that second game against the A's, Mickey Vernon leads off the second inning by bunting safely down the third baseline. This is the undoing of Alex Kellner, for a rally is in the making. Clyde Palmer is next, and he follows with a smash through the middle, which sends Vernon all the way to third. Then with one gone, Gene Verbal bangs one off Kellner's glove and Vernon streaks for home with the Nats' first run. After Grasso lines out, pitcher Masterson drills a single to center. Palmer crosses with the second run, and when Cass Michaels fails to cover second on Philly's throw-in, Verbal crosses to make it 3-0, Washington. In the fourth, the A's with no outs have Philly on third and Lauren Babe on first, but Masterson is the complete master. He strikes out Robinson. Gus Zerniel then steps up and he too goes down swinging. Allie Clark is next and with the count two and one. Masterson breezes a fastball right through and Clark is retired. The Senators make it five nothing by adding two more in the seventh. In the ninth catcher Mickey Grasso smashes Carl Scheib's first pitch into the lower left center bleachers for a four base wallet. This is Mickey's second round tripper of the season and only the fourth of an American League career that began in 1949 and all four have been at the expense of A's pitchers. That's all the scoring and the Nats throttle the Philadelphians six to nothing to make it two straight behind the brilliant two-hit pitching of Walt Masterson. Milwaukee Braves have been a revelation both to baseball fans and to manager Charlie Griff. Hard hitting third sacker Eddie Matthews slammed his eighth round tripper of the year to give the Braves a 5-3 win over the Chicago Cubs. The win put the Braves on top of the National League. Six foot two inch Lou Burdett fits three innings of perfect relief ball to assure starter Warren Spahn of his third victory in the Braves 5-3 win over the Bruins. Lou has a spotless record of 2 and nothing in emergency roles this year. Smart fielding Red Shane Deans to the St. Louis Cardinals has sparked the birds this week. Red went 11 for 17 and batted in six runs as they paced the cards to three important wins over Pittsburgh and an 11 to 9 win over the Cincinnati Reds. Rookie Pittsburgh shortstop Dick Cole led the box to a 7 to 2 win over the Philadelphia Phillies with three safeties in four trips. He's hitting close to the 300 mark and manager Fred Haney says that this bespeckled youngster can't miss. The league's leading hitter, Boston's George Kell, raced a single and a homer to give the Red Sox a 3 to 2 victory over Philadelphia in the opener of a doubleheader. The Sox also won the second game by 3 to 2 in 12 innings. Red Sox catcher Dale Wilber brought up his third pinch hit home run of the year last week to give the men of Lou Boudreau a 14-inning 3-2 win over the visiting St. Louis Browns. Vernon Stevens, Chicago White Sox third sacker, was the hero as the Sox defeated Detroit 4-2 on Saturday. He went 2-4 for four with three RBIs and his bases loaded single in the ninth won the game. Washington Senator Hurler Bob Porterfield won his fifth straight game by beating the Yankees 12-4. Bob also started the season's first triple play in the ninth inning to choke off a Yank rally. That first sacker, Mickey Vernon, who leads the major leagues in base hits, hit safely in his 18th consecutive game on Sunday and had two RBIs as Bucky Harris's charges humbled the Philadelphia Athletics 6-3. Outfielder Clyde the Clutch Balmer slammed the home run in a double and drove in five runs in the Nats' 12-4 win over New York. Hustling Philadelphia Athletics backstop Joe Astroff whacked a two-out ninth inning single to score the run that edged Chicago 2-1. With red-hot races in each league, Memorial Day weekend should prove mighty interesting. As we reach the end of the first quarter of the baseball season, the greatest star on the baseball horizon is the hustling club of the Milwaukee Braves. Telesports cameras take you on a visit to Milwaukee's County Stadium to meet the astonishing Braves in their new home. The most surprising team in baseball this year have been the Milwaukee Braves. Manager Charlie Grimm claims that his team's pitching has been the reason for the success. 
He points to Big Mac Sircon with a perfect record of six wins and no losses. Sircon is enjoying his greatest year in the big leagues, and this week he set a new modern strikeout record by fanning eight Cincinnati Red Legs in order during the course of winning his sixth game. Veteran Southpaw Warren Spahn with five wins and one loss has been a tremendous help. Warren tossed a Memorial Day six-hitter at the St. Louis Cardinals in winning a five-to-two decision. Relief artist Lou Burdett has sparkled in emergency roles. Lou saved a 6-4 win for rookie Bob Buell over St. Louis on Saturday. In seven appearances, Lou has picked up two decisions while dropping none. Three mound youngsters who have really aided the brave cause are left to right. Southpaw John Antonelli with four wins and one loss. Bob Buell, whose victory over the Cardinals on Saturday was his third win against two losses. And diminutive Southpaw Don Little, who is two and one on the year. Just out of the army, Antonelli is living up to his advance billing as a surefire star. While Bew and Little have been a couple of real pitching surprises for Charlie Grimm. While the pitching has taken the spotlight, the brave hitters have also been busy. Catcher Del Crandall is another service returnee who has looked good. Dell is batting a fat 315, and his 344 with two RBIs led the Braves to an 8-6 win over Cincinnati on Sunday. Veteran backstop Walker Cooper, with a 339 batting average in pinch hitting and spot rolls, is still a dangerous batter, and manager Grimm prefers to use the ageless coupe in tight situations. A big factor in the Braves' steady play has been the power hitting of 21-year-old third baseman Eddie Matthews. Eddie has blasted 14 home runs and has amassed 37 RBIs. His two-run round tripper on Saturday was the margin of victory in a 6-4 win over the Cardinals, and Ed came back on Sunday with two more homers as the Braves split with the Red Legs. Shortstop Johnny Logan and second baseman Jack Dittmer lead the Braves infield that paces the league defensively. Logan, a fine glove man, is hitting a respectable 278. He homered and singled in the Braves' Sunday split with Cincinnati. Keystone guardian Jack Dittmer, besides his fielding skill, has driven across 23 runs, and he's hitting 271. Powerful first baseman Joe Adcock blasted a single, double, and home run in the Braves' Saturday doubleheader sweep at St. Louis. Performing steadily in the Milwaukee Outer Garden are left to right handy Andy Pafko in right field, the speedy Bill Bruton in center, and reliable Sid Gordon in left. Pafko's stick work over the weekend was outstanding in that he went seven for 16, while Bruton and Gordon each collected three hits in the Milwaukee split with the Redlegs. Twenty-five wins in his club's first 38 games is enough to make any manager happy, and Jolly Charlie Grimm is no exception. Baseball's June 15th trade deadline drawing near, Many general managers have been spending long hours on the telephone bargaining for that much-needed long ball hitter or relief pitcher. Two National League teams have already swapped ten baseball players, and here's a report on that big trade and other headlines from the major leagues. Baseball history was made this week when Pittsburgh Pirate general manager Branch Rickey engineered a ten-player swap with the Chicago Cubs, which featured the trading of a star outfielder and home run hitter, Ralph Kiner. Along with the players, $100,000 changed hands as Buck manager Fred Haney saw four of his top players go while he welcomed six ex-Cubs. Kiner, while reluctant to leave Pittsburgh, was happy for the chance to join the Cubs where at home he'll play all daytime baseball. Ralph counted two homers for his new club on Sunday and his lifetime total of 303 circuit clouts is an all-time high for a right-handed putter in the National League. Also moving to Chicago was catcher Joe Garagiola, shown here, along with pitcher Howie Pallette and infielder outfielder George Metkovich. Garagiola takes over the number one catching spot for the Bruins. Cub manager Phil Cavaretta was elated over the deal, figuring that he now has the most fearful one-two power punch in baseball in Kiner and Hank Sauer. Moving over to Pittsburgh was outfielder Bob Addis, regarded as one of the fastest men in the game. Outfielders Gene Hermansky and Preston Ward joined Addis in the deal, although Ward has taken over at first place for the Bucks. 
Southpaw Chucker Bob Schultz moves it over to the Pirates in the deal. Manager Fred Haney plans to use Schultz in his regular pitching rotation. A sleeper in the transaction may be catcher Toby Atwell, the 29-year-old backstop who figures to give the Pirates some Class A receivers. Meanwhile, making baseball headlines this week are the rampaging New York Yankees. The Bombers have won 11 in a row for their longest winning streak ever under manager Casey Stingle. Left fielder Gene Woodling, currently hitting better than 300, accounted for three runs as the Yankees beat the Browns 7-2 for their 11th straight victory. Sparkplug shortstop Phil Rizzuto went four for nine and handled 13 chances flawlessly as unbeaten Yankee left-hander Zed Lopat and Whitey Ford both chalked up their sixth win at St. Louis on Sunday. The hustling Washington Senators, sparked by second baseman Wayne Twig Terwilliger, jumped to third place in the American League. Twig connected for a grand slam home run as Washington humbled Chicago 8-4. Ozark Ike Gus Zerniel of the Philadelphia Athletics took over the American League home run leadership on Sunday with his 13th circuit cloud of the season against the Cleveland Indians. Muscular Brooklyn first soccer Gil Hodges snapped out of a prolonged slump by blasting three home runs in two days for the Dodgers as the Bums moved into a virtual tie with the Braves for the National League lead. The boys the country over are finding Little League Baseball one of the most interesting and wholesome forms of recreation that they've ever known. Typical of the interest and work going into the Little League is this dedication ceremony in which the grand old man of baseball, Connie Mack, himself officiates. It was Connie Mack Day in Meridian, Connecticut, as small fry players to the Meridian Little League opened another campaign for honoring baseball's oldest gentleman. Mr. Mack, the grand old man of baseball, has been associated with Major League Baseball for 69 years as a player, manager, and club owner. The Little Leaguers are all eyes and ears as Mr. Mack instructs outfielder Charlie Shamara of the Gilmartin Red Rams on the proper way to whack that ball. Also enjoying Connie's enthusiastic instruction are Reverend Robert Keating and Ira Thomas, former Philadelphia Athletic star catcher and scout. Two of Ira's top scouting finds were former athletic pitching greats, Lefty Grove and George Earnshaw. Grabbing the wood, Connie tells the youngsters that many young ball players today fail to choke up enough on the bat. He demonstrates the proper grip and stance for the tiny tots to get best results. Have complete control of your bat at all times, the venerable gentleman reiterates. Concluding the ceremonies, Meridian's own Big Ed Walsh on the left joins Mr. Mack and Ira Thomas. Walsh won 40 games on the mound for the 1908 Chicago White Sox and is now one of the immortals in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. This is a day both the Little Leaguers and all of Meridian, Connecticut will long remember. A member of baseball's exclusive sensory club is the Philadelphia Phillies ace pitcher Robin Roberts. And you'll see him gain his 100th Major League victory in just a minute. The pennant-minded Braves from Milwaukee were shooting for two straight over the Phillies, and Jim Wilson was manager Grimm's mound choice to oppose the Phillies' ace right-hander Robin Roberts. Robert, the Husky right-hander who chalked up 28 wins last year, is currently aiming for his fourth straight season in the 20-game bracket. In his last outing, the Springfield rifle gained his 99th Major League win, and today he goes after his 100th victory in a little less than five years. The Phils loaded the sacks in the very first inning against Wilson, and with Larkey on third, Ashburn on second, and... By Rostek on first, Big Bill Nicholson lofts a high fly to deep right field. Andy Papko pulls it in. Larky scampers home after the catch with the first run of the game. Wilson then faces Earl Targerson, who promptly slams a screaming double to right that sends Ashburn home, and the Phillies are away to a 2 0 lead. In the fifth stands, it's Ernie Johnson on the hill, and Richie Ashburn immediately greets him with a punch single to center. This was Richie's 54th hit of the year, and sent his average well above the 300 mark, third best in the league. Johnny Wyrostek, the league's number two hitter, then drills a single to right, and the Phils have two men on with no one out.
Bill Nicholson steps in and scorches a grounder to Dittmer that forces Wyrostek at second, and Ashburn moves to third. With two men on, her first baseman Earl Targerson drills another two-base hit to right. Ashburn jogs home, and the Phils have a 3-0 lead with only one away. The bases are quickly loaded again when Granny Hamner is purposely passed. But Willie Jones crosses up the defense for sending a deep fly to right field, and Nicholson slides in with the Phils' fourth run. Catcher Smokey Burgess then hammers a single to center to send Targerson around third and across home plate with the third run of the inning. And the Phils take a 5 to nothing advantage at the end of five innings of play. In those first five innings, Roberts disposed of the first 15 men in order and was working on a no-hitter. Shortstop Jack Dittmer, however, spoils Robbie's bid by smashing a single that second baseman Lucky Larky can't handle, and Dittmer is camped on first. Pinch hitter Harry Hannabrink then wallops a long drive that pounds off the roof of the scoreboard in right center for his first Major League home run. Dittmer crosses with the Braves' first run, and Hannabrink, a rookie from Atlanta, comes home with the second to make it 6-2 to two fill. The Braves try to increase their total, but Sid Gordon becomes the last out of the game by grounding out to shortstop Granny Hamner, and the Phil's Robin Roberts notches his 100th Major League victory by pitching a three-hitter to defeat the Braves 6-2. to two. This was Robbie's 21st straight complete game and his ninth victory of the year. He's gunning for 30 wins, and if he keeps this up, he'll make it. This is Connie Mack Stadium in Philadelphia, taking on those red-hot Milwaukee Braves. I want you to see a fellow who not only is one of the best pitchers in baseball today, probably the best, I think, but already looks like one of the all-time greats. And he's only 26 years old. Robin Roberts has been a winner since he broke in, and a 20-game winner each of his last three seasons. Last year, he won 28 and lost only six, beating the champion Dodgers six times without a defeat. Roberts has poise and control, speed and control, a good curve, and more control. Yes, sir, he just doesn't walk men, and his record proves how important that is. The Phillies go right to work, with Jack Larky walking and Richie Ashburn lying on the single to left, the first two men up in the game. After Johnny Rarostek walks to load the bases, Bill Nicholson flies deep to any path going right, and Larky scores. Jim Wilson isn't out of the woods yet. Earl Targerson hits a screamer, and I mean screamer, to right for two bases, scoring Ashburn. That's two runs back of Roberts in the first inning, and an early shower for Wilson. Not a man has reached base for Milwaukee in five innings when Ashburn gets his second single for the Phillies to open their half of the fifth. Wyrostek lines his hit into left field. And Charlie still doesn't look very grim. Earl Johnson, who relieved Wilson in the first, is weakening, and Torgerson is enjoying himself against his old team. And this is his second double in a clutch, sending Ashburn over the plate. Willie Jones puts over another run, a fly to Pat though, long enough for Nicholson to score, and now Roberts has a five and nothing lead. A single by Jack Dittmore in the sixth is the first hit off Roberts, and then a rookie pinch hitter, Harry Hannabrink, clubs a powerful shot to right center, and it bounces off the top of the scoreboard for a home run. His first big league hit, and a homer off Roberts is quite a start for a young fellow. And watch him prance here. Here's the last brave threat. An error and a hit put two men on base with nobody out. Now that's when Roberts is at his best. He really pours it on in situations like this. And neither runner advances, and he wins 6-2. This is the 100th game Roberts has won in the majors, 
the first man to win 100 for the Phils since old Grover Cleveland Alexander. Robin is not only a great pitcher, I found him to be quite a great fellow too. And now he's going to tell us something about himself. Robin, I want to ask you a little bit about the, all this news you've been getting about having eight different speeds on your fastball. Is there any truth to that? Well, I read that, Tommy, and I was quite amazed to find that out. <laughs> I, uh, I have a uh, tendency to get in a little trouble, it seems, when uh, the ball game, when we got a big lead or at the start of a ball game, it seems like I'm always in trouble before I throw hard. And I can't explain that too well. I don't bear down right away. I wish I could because I don't like to get in trouble any more than anybody else. Do you get in trouble in the first innings? I do yeah. a lot. Uh, if I get in trouble, usually it's early in the ball game. Mm -hmm. After about fourth or fifth, if I settle down, I usually am in better shape than, uh, than the first few innings in the game. But as far as the different speeds, if I got eight different speeds, I'm amazed because I never knew. I throw <laughs> the same speed all the time. Sometimes when I get in trouble, I may throw a little harder, but... Uh, that's the sign of a pretty good yeah, pitcher. Most of the time, I just, I don't believe I got eight speed. I hope they keep thinking that, though, Tommy. <laughs> That's very good to have you them got thinking them fooled, that. Huh? Yeah. Well, the main thing is that, uh, like re all the great pitchers of the past, when you do get in trouble, even at the end of the line, you've got a little bit more to show them. Yet, well, right? I, I've always been uh, able to finish up pretty strong. I believe that helps the pitcher. All right. Robin, I see Steve O'Neill's got you working every two or three days. How to, Did he talk it over with you, and how do you think it'll affect you? Well, uh, Tommy, he asked us in spring training, uh, he asked us individually if we could pitch with two days rest. And uh, How many did he ask? Uh, well, he asked Simmons and Drews and myself. He planned on using us as much as possible and Constanti as the fourth starter. And I told uh, Mr. O'Neill that I can work occasionally with two days rest, which I've done before, and I'll do, after, you know, later on. But... Three days rest is the ideal rest for me. But if he wants me to pitch with two days rest occasionally, I can do it. I've done it before, and it doesn't hurt me too much. But I wouldn't want to do it uh, four or five times in a row. I think I may get a little weary. Do you think that uh, you can do that for a few years while you're as young as you are? Well, yes. I think uh, I can do it as long as I'm able to win up in the big leagues. Because with two days rest, I can pitch, mind you, and I got good control. And um, I might not be quite as fast, but my curveball seems to be a little better when I'm not so fast, which is, uh, I think you'll find that in a lot of pitchers. You say not as fast, not as fast as whom? Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Those Two national leaguers tell me that you're as fast as anybody. Well, I don't know. Sometimes I throw fairly hard, but <laughs> sometimes I got a, I got a buddy over there in Philly, that Lefty Simmons, he throws pretty hard, too. Yeah, he's having a pretty good year, too. Isn't he's he? doing wonderful. He really is, Tommy. Well, maybe the, between the two of you, you'll win maybe uh, 50, 55 ball games. I don't know. Year. I just hope we're pitching in the cold October. I think that's when you got to pitch to have any fun. Best of luck to you. Thank Robin. you, Tommy. Right. It's Ebbets Field, where they say everything happens. And it's the Giants shooting for their eighth straight against the Dodgers on a home run rampage. Russ Meyer is the Brooklyn pitcher, and Al Dark hits him for a single in the first inning. Hank Thompson smacks another hit to right, and the Dodgers are in trouble right now as Dark goes to third. Meyer fires again, and Monty Irvin doesn't wait. He blasts the first pitch out to center, and it's in the center field stand. The Dodgers need only one today to break the Yankees' record of homers in 25 straight games, but it's the Giants who get the home run and are off for three runs. Al Worthington is pitching for the Giants, and the Dodgers make their first threat in the fourth. Duke Snyder single puts two on base, only one out. Worthington's up against a tough man, Roy Campanella. But Roy slaps one down to Darrell Spencer, and a double play wipes out the Dodgers. Giants are at it again in the fifth. Thompson singles to score Lockman, who had doubled, and Dark goes to third. Meyer starts 
the pump, and watch this now. Dark takes off and steals home, and Meyer hasn't even turned the ball loose. Late in the game, the Dodgers have stopped worrying about home runs now. They'll take any kind of run. In the seventh, Snyder goes down swinging on Worthington's stuff. Al's first start was a two-hit shot out of the Phillies. He mows the Dodgers down six to nothing, stops their home run streak at 24 games, hands them their first whitewashing of the season, and he's the fifth rookie pitcher in the big league history to start with two shutout games. Just one of the best hitters who ever lived, that's Captain Ted Williams of the Marines back in the United States after 39 jet missions over Korea. Ted is back for a treatment of an ear ailment, but he's due out of service in the fall, and the American League pitchers better get ready to duck. Ted's a little heavier than he was, and he says he hasn't had a bat in his hand in 16 months. He'll need about 16 minutes batting practice, the way I figured. Here's what he thinks about his baseball future. Well, it's awfully hard for me to tell you what I'm gonna do from now on, as you know, uh... I still have three more months to uh, do in the uh, Marine Corps uh, if I complete my full tour, and uh, which ends in October. And as you know, the baseball season ends in September. So it's, uh, it's pretty easy to see that I probably am not going to play any baseball in 1953. You think your baseball career will be handicapped in any way? Uh, certainly it's going to be hard for me to get back in the swing of things. I mean. Uh, I left at the age of 33. I'm going to return at the age of 35. Uh, I know that uh, as uh, I got older, even in the, in the early 30s, that I was progressively getting uh, a harder time. It was harder for me to get in shape. So I know that after two years off, it's going to be even harder. And how many home runs will he be able to hit? Let's see what he says about that. I really don't know whether I can hit as many home runs as I, uh, I uh, have. Uh, I, it was always pretty hard to hit him as it was. Uh, I just uh, hope that I'll feel and uh, that I can and that the uh, Red Sox might uh, want me to try. Nation's baseball fans are firmly in the grip of all-star fever. The voting has been heavy and some of the final choices were in doubt right down to the wire. Let's take a look at the final starting lineup of the American League All-Stars. We'll be taking the field under the guidance of Casey Stingle. The Junior Loops All-Star aggregation will again be managed by Casey Stengel, pilot of the world champion New York Yankees, and all cases determined to avenge last year's setback. Washington's Mickey Vernon is the unanimous choice to open at first base. Mickey's defensive work is tops, and at the plate this season, the Nats' leading hitter has kept his average well over the 300 mark and has always been in the select group of the league's top 10 hitters. For the second base assignment, the Red Sox Billy Goodman was finally voted 1953's All-Star second baseman after a close battle with Chicago's Nellie Fox. The versatile Bo Sox second sacker is enjoying another great season and is currently only a few points behind the league's leading batsman, teammate George Kell. At the hot corner, Cleveland's Al Flip Rosen gained the nod over the Red Sox George Kell. Al has stayed well above the 300 mark all season, and his potent bat is one of the factors in the tribe's bid to overtake the league-leading Yankees. Al has always been up with the leaders in the home run department, and he's just as good at coming through with that run-producing single. At shortstop, Chicago's Chico Carrasquel ran a nip and tuck race with Phil Rizzuto. Chico's slick fielding and steady hitting has been a great part of Chicago's second place showing. The Athletics' mighty Big Gus Zerniel is the top choice to cover the left field acreage. The powerful giant was the home run and RBI king of the American League in 1951 and is currently leading the loop in this year's production of four base wallops. Tall and well built, the handsome outfielder presents 210 pounds of slugging dynamite and despite his great size, Gus turns in a mighty fine bit of fly chasing while covering the left field pasture for the Dykes men.
The Yankee star center fielder Mickey Mantle is the American League's individual leader in total votes. Batting well over 300 and banging out home runs with that Joe DiMaggio emphasis, the fleet outfielder is rapidly becoming one of the Yanks' all-time greats. Hank Bauer, another member of the world champion New Yorkers, will be the all-star right fielder. Hank's steady outfield play and consistent hitting, which keeps his average hovering around the 300 mark, are two good reasons why the fast-stepping outfielder has been chosen to open the 1953 Classic in right. Yogi Berra, another Yankee stalwart, is once more in his familiar role as the American League's all-star receiver. Popular with his teammates and a favorite with the fans, the powerful Yankee backstop appears a good bet to add his name to the long list of great catchers who have played for the Yankees down through the years. In the pitching department, manager Stengel has his choice of some of the finest pitchers in baseball. Boston's Mel Parnell, who recently garnered his 100th Major League triumph at the expense of the Yankees, has already notched 11 victories and is well on his way to a 20-game year. Chicago's diminutive southpaw Billy Pierce is fast developing into one of the loop's best pitchers, and Billy is prepared to make it plenty tough for those National League clouters. Washington's Bob Porterfield, with ten victories and five shutouts to his credit, will be a sure-fire selection to twirl for the American Leaguers. Cleveland's Mike Garcia continues to overpower the opposition with his blazing fastball and is ready to mow down those National League hitters. Early win, another of Cleveland's star chuckers, or teammate Bob Lemon, could be one of manager Stengel's selections come July 14th. It all adds up to bad news for the National Leaguers. We'll see what their lineup is later in the show. Wilson promised you here are the National League All-Stars whom the senior circuit fans have chosen to face the cream of the American League in Tuesday's annual All-Star game at Cincinnati. Managing the National Leaguers in this year's dream game will be Brooklyn's general boss man Charlie Dressen and this is how his team figures and shakes up. For the first base job, the Cincinnati Redlegs' Ted Kluzewski was the leading vote-getter. Big Clue is enjoying one of his finest years in the big show. He's been well up among the leaders in home runs and runs batted in all season. Red Shane Deans to the St. Louis Cardinals has the second base job all to himself. From the outset of the season, Shane Deans has been one of the top three batsmen in the senior circuit. Red is no stranger to all-star competition, and National League rooters will long remember Red's 10th inning home run that sent the American League down to defeat in 1951. Third baseman Eddie Matthews of the Milwaukee Braves, who was only in his second year in the majors, was the unanimous choice for the hot corner. Ed has been turning in a wonderful defensive job at the hot spot for the pennant-minded Braves, and you can be sure that American League hurlers will be plenty careful in pitching to this young slugger. Red has been in a tense duel with Cincinnati's Ted Kluzewski for the senior circuit's home run honors. Brooklyn Dodgers shortstop Harold Pee Wee Reese, an all-star game veteran, was once more selected for the short field position. Pee Wee just keeps rolling along as a top-fielding shortstop who can more than uphold his end with the willow. For the left field position, it's Dan the Man Musial of the St. Louis Cardinals. Musial, one of the finest hitters in the game today, was in a rare early season slump. But the man pulled out and has increased his average over 50 points to raise it to the charm 300 circle. This will be the eighth time Musial has started in baseball's greatest attraction. The center field post from the National League goes to Gus Bell of the Cincinnati Red Lakes. Hard hitting Gus has come into his own this year. Bell's big bat has been banging out home runs, driving in runs, and sounding off at a clip well above 300 for the first half of the season. The fans' first choice for the right field position went to the St. Louis Cardinals, veteran right fielder, Anos Country Slaughter. Slaughter is having another great year and has been one of the principal factors in the Cardinals' strong bid for the National League League. Roy Campanella, the Brooklyn Dodgers, once more gained the nomination as the National Leaguer's all-star catcher. The fans have nominated Roy as the number one receiver for the past four years. 
The Bills' Robin Roberts, who was well on his way to another 28-game year, is certain to be one of manager Dressen's selections to hurl against the American League stars. The Milwaukee Braves' Max Surkamp has been one of the league's top winners, and the veteran right-hander is ready to tow the rubber come July the 14th. Jerry Staley of the Cardinals leads the loop in the hurling department and will probably be one of Dresson's mound choices to oppose the American League stars. And finally, the Braves' top relief artist, Lou Burdett, is just one of the league's sensational relief specialists who will be ready and waiting in the National League bullpen. The major leagues, mid-season, at this point, the American League chase doesn't look like the runaway for the Yanks that it was about a month ago. The Red Hat White Sox are on the move in second place. The Cleveland Indians are suddenly slugging away in third place. The Yankee lead is dwindling, and we'll have to see what happens. Turning to the National League, five teams are in contention, and that looks like a red-hot race right down to the wire. So let's take a swing around both leagues to check the mid-season stats. The defending champion New York Yankees continue to lead the American League, and the men of Casey Stengel are set on winning their fifth straight flag. Casey points to his pitching as the reason for his team's lofty perch. South Boy De Lopat has won nine and dropped only one. While right-handed Johnny Sane has a nine and four loss. He has hurled 129 innings, which is tops on the squad. The Yankee hitters have also been busy. Mickey Mantle, New York center field successor to Joe DiMaggio, is batting well over 300 and has already established himself as one of the Yankee all-time greats. The often underrated Gene Woodley is one of the league's top hitters. Gene has been extremely valuable to Stengel as a spot player and his consistent work in either left or right field has really aided the Bombers. Southpaw pitcher Billy Pierce paces the second place Chicago White Sox, only five games behind the Yanks. Billy's record is 10 wins and five losses, and the Chai Sox fans feel that this is the year for him to cop 20 games. Chai Sox left fielder Minnie Minoso has sparked the Sox surge with a 320 average, and he is second best RBI man in the league. Little Nellie Fox, the pale hole's mighty second baseman, has found the hitting range. By picking up 44 points in two weeks, he is only a few points shy of 290. In third place are the Cleveland Indians, who are eight and a half games off the pace. Bob Lemon leads the tribe pitches with an 11 and eight mark. Homer hammering third baseman Al Rosen heads the league with 22 circuit clouts and his 72 RBIs give him the league lead in that department with room to spare. Another important tribe man with the wood is center fielder Larry Dope. Larry is numbered among the top sluggers with 16 homers and 52 runs batted in. Over in the National League, manager Charlie Dressen and his power-laden Brooklyn Dodgers are on top. Center fielder Duke Snyder, with a 315 batting mark and 55 RBIs, has been a Dodger vital cog. His outfielding mate, Carl Ferrillo, is enjoying his best season 
since entering the big leagues with a 327 batting average. While catcher Roy Campanella on the left and the versatile Jackie Robinson have been a double dose of poison to Dodger rivals on many occasions. The second place Milwaukee Braves, paced by Eddie Matthews, are only one and a half games behind Brooklyn. Matthews leads the majors in home runs with 27 and RBI 75. Pacing the Braves' moundsman is the veteran Warren Spahn. Warren beat the Cardinals 5-2 for his 11th win against only three losses. The third-place Phillies, led by their incomparable right-hander Robin Roberts, are only four games from first. Roberts posted his 14th win against Pittsburgh. Granny Hamner found the switch from shortstop to second base appealing by adding 20 points to his batting average. Red Chaindienst, the league's leading batter, leads the St. Louis Cardinal drive, only two percentage points behind the fields. Another factor has been the play of Stan Musial, who looks about ready to win his seventh batting crown. Outfielder Monty Irvin leads the fifth place New York Giants, six and a half games out of first. Monty's 68 RBIs make him one of the league's best. Bobby Thompson's play has also been outstanding. Bobby's hitting 309. And should he and the rest of the Giants continue their top flight play, a pennant may be in the offing. Turning now to the national pastime, we're going to take a look at a club which is attaining a prominence in baseball that the Harlem Globetrotters have achieved in basketball. It's the fabulous Indianapolis Clowns of the Negro American League. Let's get out to the ballpark and see what makes them famous. The Indianapolis Clowns of the Negro American Baseball League present one of the most unusual rosters in baseball. In addition to carrying two real clowns with the team, the Indianapolis Nine is bolstered by a feminine touch at the second base position. Miss Tony Stone, a 23-year-old, is the first woman ever to perform in the NAL. Many observers say that she swings that wood just as hard as many men. By the way, fellows, she's just as handy with a rolling pin, too. Shown sharpening her batting eye, Miss Stone is a very fast afoot and is among the league leaders in hitting and stolen bases. Her batting average adds up to a neat 302, which is fine hitting in any man's league. Uh oh, here we have the clown's two funny men, Mr. Speck Bebop, handling the short end, and King Tut. From the looks of these two, maybe we'll have a couple of candidates for next year's rowing regatta. Getting back to Miss Stone, her defensive ability thus far this year has been outstanding. As is the case with the men, she'll tell you that her toughest assignment is making that double play pivot. Yes, from all appearances, this second base lady is up in the NAL to stay, which makes us conscious more and more each day of that old axiom, it's a woman's world. After dusting off the dish, Mr. Bebop and his side-splitting counterpart, King Tut, engage in a friendly little game of button-button who's got the baseball. And brother, these two magicians handle that ball like a hot potato. A friendly handshake between Tut and his three-and-a-half-foot partner puts an end to the poor man's juggling act and brings howls from the crowd. Back for more is Mr. Tut, who demonstrates the lazy man's way of playing catch. With laugh-provoking antics such as these and a woman playing the keystone sack, the Indianapolis Clowns are the most unusual ball club in the game today. Well, in baseball, there's a fella named Fella, who at 35 still has the world by the tail. He signed with Cleveland at 17, and never pitched a game of minor league ball at all. He just kicked up that left foot and started firing them across to become baseball's strikeout king. After 14 years, he may have lost a little speed, but Bob Fella still gets him out with that curve, as you're going to see right now. 
Manager Al Lopez and his third place Cleveland Indians invaded Philadelphia's Connie Mack Stadium to battle Jim Dyke's Philadelphia Athletics in the second game of a four-game series. Rapid Robert Feller, one of baseball's all-time pitching greats, will hurl for the tribe. While toying the slab for Philadelphia is Big Charlie Bishop, a 29-year-old fastballer from Atlanta, Georgia. At the start of the battle, Bishop's control is a bit erratic, and he walks leadoff man Alphonse Smith. The next man is retired, but hard-hitting Larry Doby belts a solid single to right field that enables the speedy Smith to leg it all the way to the far turn. With men on first and third, long ball hitting Al Rosen drives a towering fly to Gus Zerniel in left center that allows Smith to tag up and race home after the catch with the initial run of the game. And after the first inning, it's Cleveland one, Philadelphia nothing. Both hurlers throw goose eggs for the next three innings and right fielder Smith, purchased by the Tribe from Indianapolis two weeks ago, swats a line single to left field to open the Cleveland fifth. Aggressive Billy Glenn, the Indian smallish first baseman, then wallops a nothing in two pitch deep into the far reaches of right field. A lusty poke bounds off the wall for a two base hit that sends Smith over to third base easily. Bishop pitches carefully to Larry Doby and he gets him to bounce weakly to second base. However, the slow hit ball enables the fleet-footed Smith to tally another tribe marker, and Cleveland leads 2-0. With Glenn on third and two out, Al Rosen booms Bishop's first toss high over the left center field roof for a mighty two-run circuit clout that scores Glenn as well as himself. The blow, reminiscent of the type Jimmy Fox used to hit at Philadelphia, is Al's 27th round tripper of the season, tops in the American League. The Indians add another run in the sixth to make the count read 5-0. The A's are unable to do a thing with the pitching slants of Bobby Feller, and he goes into the final inning with a shutout. However, fate takes a hand in the ninth as third baseman Lauren Bay bloops to the opposite field off the glove of Wally Westlake for a scratch double. Feller retires the dangerous Eddie Robinson, but big Gus Zerniel powders a cross-country blast deep into the left center field bleachers, high above the 405-foot mark. A mighty blow tallies Lauren Babe with the Athletics' first run, and Ozark Ike completes the tour with the second. The big outfielder now has 25 homers, only two behind the league-leading Al Rosen. However, that's all the offensive that the Dykes men can muster as Bobby Feller turns back the A's by a 5-2 count for the 245th win of his sparkling big league career. The Indians went on to sweep the other three games of the series and are solidly entrenched in third place in the American League. Well, selecting baseball's rookie of the year before the end of the season is a pretty ticklish proposition. Uh, but we feel that among the eight young ball players you're going to see you will find two outstanding freshmen, one for each league. Looking at the National League, the St. Louis Cardinals' top candidate for Rookie of the Year laurels is center fielder Eldon Rip Ripulski, hailed by many Redbird followers as another Terry Moore. Rip is a brilliant fielder and has been hitting near the 300 mark all season long. Very fleet afoot, Rip can run the 100-yard dash in 10 seconds. Eddie Stanky has been mighty pleased with the steady work of this 25-year-old native of Minnesota. The Brooklyn Dodgers have Junior Gilliam, their top flight freshman second sacker. A switch hitter and an excellent leadoff man, Junior's fine play forced the Dodgers to move Jackie Robinson off the keystone bag and into left field. 
Long ball hitting Darrell Spencer is the New York Giants' top yearling. Darrell is at home either at third, short, or second base. From the Rhineland, Jim Greengrass has given the Cincinnati Redlegs plenty of heads-up play from his left field spot. A terror with the wood, Jim's ability to drive in runs has been invaluable to the men of Hornsby. In the American League, 22-year-old Harvey Keen, the Detroit Tigers' phenomenal shortstop, looks like one of the top rookies in the junior circuit. Keen is a former University of Wisconsin star whose uncanny knack of getting base hits has sparked an otherwise drab season for the Bengals. The Boston Red Sox, Tommy Umflett, a relative unknown at the season start, has blossomed into a real star. Tommy's play in the center field pasture is reminiscent of his brilliant predecessor, Dominic DiMaggio. Shortstop Billy Hunter of the St. Louis Browns is another great first-year man whose steady play earned him a berth on the league's all-star team. Husky catcher Bob Red Wilson is the Chicago White Sox top freshman. Possessor of a strong arm, this six-foot, 200-pounder, like Harvey Keene, is a product of the University of Wisconsin. We think that in this group of outstanding freshmen, you will find 1953's Rookie of the Year. Back old times the other night when I saw Lefty Gomez take the hill. Leo DeRocha and Frankie Frisch playing together as teammates. And the fabulous Mickey Cochran once again behind the plate. How did all this come about? Watch and see. The baseball clock was turned back for more than 20 grand veterans of the national pastime who gathered at Connie Mac Stadium in Philadelphia as guests of the Philadelphia Phillies. Among those on hand are Frank Bruggy, former Phillies star, and Cy Perkins, an ex-athletic immortal. Ex-Phil star, Stan Baumgartner. Mickey Cochran, one of baseball's all-time great catchers, and Lefty Grove, who won 300 games during his sparkling big league career. New York Giants manager Leo DeRocha and his old-time teammate on the St. Louis Cardinal Gas House Gang, Frankie Frisch, appear fit. Three port siders, who would make a mean hurling core are ex-Yankee Lefty Gomez, present Phil's Southpaw Kurt Simmons, and Lefty Grove. Gomez is considered the Yankee premier all-time left-hander. Simmons has all the makings of a really fine hurler, and no doubt the advice handed out by the former athletics great, Lefty Grove, is going in Kurt's ear to stay. As the old-timers line up prior to an exhibition game against the little bigger league stars, 86-year-old Cy Young is introduced to the crowd. Cy compiled the amazing total of 511 pitching victories, averaging 25 wins per year for over 20 years. The little bigger league stars, all youngsters between 13 and 15 years of age, take the field. The opening inning finds former A's great Max Bishop lashing a solid single to right field, and the old-timers are off and running. However, the hit-and-run play backfires, as Lippy Lee DeRosier wraps into a fast double play, and the tussle is scoreless after the first inning. In the second inning, Lefty Gomez fires, and Jimmy McQuaid of Seattle beats out an infield hit. After McQuaid steals second, Tommy Bressler of Cincinnati singles to left, and McQuaid scores as the youngsters lead one to nothing. Bressler is the son of Rube Bressler, erstwhile National League star. Young Bressler pilfers second and third, but trying to emulate the great Ty Cobb, he is out attempting to steal home, and it's one to nothing after one and a half. Former Washington star George Case opens the old-timers' turn with an infield bounder to third base, and he's safe on the bobble. The ex-Fordham Flash, Frankie Frisch, has a close shave with a pitch, and he delights the crowd with some of the fire for which he was renowned. On a three-and-nothing toss, Frankie gets a base on ball. And two of the best base runners in Major League history are on the base paths as George Case moves to second base. As 
ex-Yankee bullet Joe Bush strikes out, Case and Frisch work a double steal, and the old-timers are on a good spot to score. Right fielder Joe Schoet lines a single to center that scores Case with a tying run, but the youngsters trap Frisch off third, and he's waved out by umpire Jock O'Connell. The game ends in a one-to-one -one tie, and it's into the clubhouse and the rubbing alcohol for the old-timers. Oh, my aching back. Back from Korea comes baseball's Ted Williams. The famous slugger receives his release from the Marine Corps in Washington. And now, what about baseball, Ted? Needless to say, I'm, I'm anxious to uh, see if uh, I can still hit. And uh, with the young club uh, that the Red Sox have, and uh, if I can uh, swing a bat at all, why, uh, maybe I can help. I certainly hope so. Be happy to get back up there in the old you said it. Yeah, to hear those guys with their bazoos out in left field, that'll be all right. <laughs> back in Boston, Ted signs with Red Sox bosses Cronin and Yawkey. There's a new contract for him covering the remainder of this season as well as 1954. And Williams is raring to go. His familiar uniform is ready for him. So out to left field in Fenway Park for a preliminary warm-up. He won't be in the lineup immediately, but he'll be clouding them soon. And one thing is certain, there aren't any bazoos in the stands today. Many surprises. Some of the stars who are expected to be great never show anything, while fans and managers are thrilled by some great comebacks. This week, Telesports Digest takes you on a swing around the American League to investigate some of the season's greatest comeback stories. Veteran New York Yankee manager Casey Stengel has been blessed with an abundance of improved ball players. Probably his biggest surprise of this year came from his pudgy southpaw Eddie Lopat. Offered a one dollar contract at the beginning of the year because of arm trouble, Lopat has regained the form that made him a 21 game winner in 1951. The Chicago White Sox fastballing right-hander Virgil Trucks is a definite candidate for comeback of the year honors among the pitchers. At Detroit last season, it looked like he was headed down the has-been trail. While this year in a complete reversal of form, he's almost a cinch to become the White Sox first 20-game winner since 1941. The Sox's ace lefty Billy Pierce is also in his greatest season. Billy performed brilliantly as the American League starting hurler in the All-Star game. Mickey Vernon, Washington Senator first baseman and 1946 American League batting champion, is belting the horse hide like a youngster again, and he could succeed Ferris Fane as the league's king of SWAT. At 35, Mickey is making many a fan wonder if age really makes a difference in baseball. His teammate, pitcher Bob Porterfield, has already increased his winning percentage some 20% over last year. Specializing in whitewash jobs this season, Bob bids fair to becoming Washington's first 20-game winner in eight years. After suffering a nervous breakdown in 1952, the Boston Red Sox' Jimmy Pearsall has returned in a brilliant manner. Coach Bill McKechnie, a keen observer of ball players, recently called Pearsall the greatest right fielder of them all. Another reason for the Red Sox entrenchment in the first division is 39-year-old relief hurler Ellis Kinder. Figured as being washed up after having arm trouble last season, Ellis has either won or saved at least 30 games for the Sox this year. One of the most heartwarming comebacks of the year is the return of the big guy, Ted Williams, to the Boston Red Sox. After a hitch in Korea, Ted was a big question mark until he stepped up to the plate the first few times. Ted is the last active major leaguer to bat 400 in a single season, a feat he performed in 1941 with a 406 average. With comebacks such as these, fans everywhere have been treated to some real old-fashioned baseball this year. Come out from behind that glove, I know you. It's Bob Porterfield, the first American League pitcher to win 20 games this season. We sent one of our men down to ask Bob how he accounts for his great success at Washington. Bob, what caused this tremendous improvement of yours since coming to Sanders? Was it something Bucky Harris did or something you did yourself? Well, everything had uh, something to do with it, and uh, I believe that uh, Bucky's confidence in me and uh, knowing that 
I would do the work for him and everything. It's uh, it's helped me and it's, it's helped Bucky too. For uh, years ago, I helped Bucky lose his job, and uh, I'm trying to make it up to him now. And uh, I couldn't do it for a nicer guy. And of course, uh, I've come up with a new pitch, which is a slider, and it's uh, helped helped me tremendously. And as, long, as I said before, uh, Bucky's confidence in me it's uh, had a lot to do with. Bob, do you feel as much pressure here with this club as you did in New York? No, you certainly don't. For with New York, see, they're in the habit of winning the pennant so much, and uh, every ball game really means something to him. Of course, it does here too, but you are not under as much pressure uh, here as you are there. And here, I know what I'm going to do from one pit, uh, pitching turn to the other. And all the boys are real nice. And of course, Bucky has, uh, as I can't uh, praise him enough for what he's done for me. And uh, there's not half as much pressure here as it would be with some other ball club. Here's the way Bob grips that ball, along the seams. And you can see what a supple wrist he's got. That gets plenty on both a fast one and a curve. He's won 21 so far, lost only 10. And imagine how far out in front the Yankees would have been if they'd kept him. But he didn't hurt them too much either. He beat Cleveland five times, and Speck Shea, another former Yankee, beat the Indians four. That almost accounts for the Yankee margin over the tribe. Another proof of Porterfield's effectiveness is his shutout record. He's pitched eight this season. Now take a look at Bob in action. Here he is working a night game against Chicago, gunning for his 21st victory. He gets out of his spot when an attempt to steal is headed off, then sets the next hitter down with no trouble. Late in the game, the Senators come through with a run that breaks the 2-2 two -two tie in Bob's duel with the White Sox ace, Billy Pierce. And that's enough for Porterfield. He fans the last man for a 3-2 decision, the 21st victory he scored this season. Looking at the American League leaders, manager Casey Stengel of the New York Yankees presented southpaw Eddie Lopat, who won 16 and lost only four, to pace the junior circuit percentage-wise. Steady Eddie also topped the league's pitchers in the important earned run average column. Boston Red Sox southpaw Mel Parnell with 21 and 8 became the first American League pitcher in 35 years to shut out the world champion Yankees four times in a single season. Winner of the batting crown in the American Loop was Mickey Vernon, the slim Washington Senator first sacker. Mickey's 337 average gave him the crown by a slim one point margin over Cleveland's Al Rosen. In capturing his second batting championship, Mickey also had his greatest year at driving in runs by totaling 116. Al Rosen, Cleveland third sacker, led the circuit both in homers with 43 and RBIs with 144. A real competitor, Al established a new Cleveland club record for round trippers by breaking Hal Trotsky's 17-year-old mark. Over in the National League, the Milwaukee Braves and manager Charlie Grimm boasted the league's top home run hitter in 21-year-old Eddie Matthews, who paced the majors in circuit clouts with 47. The Braves' ace southpaw Warren Spahn posted a brilliant 23 win and 7 lost mark and topped the senior circuit in earned run average. Warren's 23 wins tied Robin Roberts for high in total victories. Brooklyn Dodger manager Charlie Dressen's forces earned the other major crowns. Outfielder Carl Ferrillo, although sidelined with an injury for most of September, captured the batting laurels with a 344 mark. And Husky Roy Campanella's 142 RBIs spread eagle the field. Roy also established new all-time marks for backstoppers in RBIs and homers. Baseball reaches its climax. It's World Series time again, with the same teams that have been battling it out so often the last few years at it again. 
Yes, it's another subway series between the Yankees and Dodgers, but it's changed a lot. From the Bronx to Brooklyn used to be only a nickel. Then it went to a dime. And now it takes a 15 cent token. Everybody's interviewed the managers, figured out all the angles on the pitchers, and sized up the hitters. But let's move in and see what we can get right from the inside of the dugout. Here's the Yankee bat boy, Joe Carrieri. How old are you, Joe? 17 years old and a senior in Carmel Hayes High School. How did you manage to get the job as Yankee bat boy? Well, I got the job to my brother Ralph, who was Yankee ball boy for five years here at Yankee Stadium. How long have you been the bat boy for the Yanks? My third year as bat boy with the Yankees. Do you get a share of the money when they win a pennant? Well, last year I, I got one. Tell us, Joe, what do you think of the Dodgers? Well, Tommy, they're a tough team. They'll give us a good fight in the World Series. Well, how do you think the series will turn out? I don't think there's a doubt about it. The Yankees are going to win. <laughs> and now meet Charlie Di Giovanna, custodian of the Brooklyn lumber pile. Charlie's not exactly a boy. He has a wife and family. Here he is with his little boy and his wife and baby daughter. And here's Barron. He's a Dodger fan, too. Charlie's hobby is building things around his house, and all of them reflect the baseball influence. This lamp is made of a bat with Dodger team scenes on the shade. De Giovanna is probably the only bat boy who makes a career out of it. He's just as much wedded to the Dodgers now as he is to his own family. He's been with four championship teams, and last year the club gave him half a share in the series. What do you say we collar him and get the lowdown on the Brooks? Say, Charlie, tell us how you got your job as bat boy for the Dodgers. Well, Tommy, uh, when I was very young, I was in a cardiac institution and uh, wasn't allowed to play any ball at all. And uh, I started reading about the Dodgers and about baseball. And I decided to write a letter to Leo DeRocha, who was then the manager of the Dodgers, and asked for an autographed ball. And uh, he sent it to me. And when, as soon as I got out of his institution, I made it my business to come right down here to Ebbets Field to thank him uh, for the ball. After that, he started liking me and inviting me to come to the ball game every day and taking me in. And, before you know it, he got me a job as a turnstile boy here for 50 cents a day. That's 1941. After that, I began running errands, and I became a visiting team clubhouse boy. That's the clubhouse boy and bat boy for all the teams that the Dodgers play, the Giants and the Cardinals, Cincinnati and the rest. And, uh, well, three years ago, I got my break, and I became the Brooklyn bat boy. Well, the Dodgers have had plenty of experience with the Yankees. What do you think of them? Well, Tommy, you know, you played with the, the great team that they are, the Yankees. Anybody that puts on that uniform seems to be a great ball player. They've got the spirit, they've got the hustle and the fight, and they've got good pitching, good hitting, everything to go with it to make it a, a real good World Series. Well, if they're that good, how do you think you'll do? Ha, <laughs> we'll murder them. Well, here's where it ended last year, with the Yankees beating the Dodgers four games to three, in one of the best World Series ever played. And this is the way it ended. Well, I picked the two pennant winners this year. Honestly, I don't see how anybody could miss. So I'll try to pick the winner of the series. Now, I wouldn't try to tell anybody how to run his ball club. Certainly no manager as smart as Casey Stengel. But I do think a lot depends on how and where he spots his right-handers and left-handers. Allie Reynolds and Vic Rashi don't look as powerful as they did last year. But Eddie Lopat looks a lot better, and Case also has Whitey Ford. Reynolds helped stop that Dodger right-hand power last year. This is the only homer Jackie Robinson got. But can the Yanks do it again? Robin Roberts here, found stopping Roy Campanella is a different story from last season. 
Roy's had the best season of his life. Gil Hodges went 0 for 21 in the last series. Do you think that will happen again? I don't. After a terrible start, Gil has conquered himself. He's now one of the top sluggers and run drivers of the league. The Yanks held those three fellows to a combined average of 139. It isn't in the cards, they won't hit better. But Duke Snyder can't hit much better. He hammered four home runs last October. Carl Farello is a real key man in the setup. He's got a broken finger, and if he's out or isn't in top condition, the Dodgers will miss him plenty. Here's why they'll miss Farello, and maybe Andy Papco. The sensational catches of the Dodger outfield were one of the outstanding features last year. It might not even have been close without such fielding. If both Farrello and Papco are out, and Papco's with Milwaukee now, then it won't by any means be the same Brooklyn outfield. And the Brooks can't dig up any other fly chasers to make catches like these. How do you like that? Don't forget, the Yankees have some outfielders too. Fellows like Gene Woodling, who can belt that ball as well as go and get it. Mickey Mandel mangled the Dodger pitching staff with hits of all sizes last fall. And Mickey has been gone for distance lately. They'll have lots of trouble with him. And if Yogi Berra can't fully match Campanella behind the bat, he's a match for anybody with that bat in his hand. Here's one trump card the Yankees have Brooklyn can't approach. Johnny Mize, one of the soundest hitters in the game. His homer saved the Yanks last year. And Casey Stengel can put him in there at any time and say, here's my pinch hitter. I don't care who your pitcher is. There isn't much to choose in the infield. Here's a great tag at second base Phil Rizzuto made for the Yanks last year. But Pee Wee Reese is just about as good. They're probably the best two shortstops in the game. Now back to pitching. You can say that Carl Erskine here and Preacher Rowe are a match for any two on the Yankee staff. But even though Brooklyn has added Russ Meyer, I don't think their staff is as deep in sound pitching as the Yankees. After Erskine and Rowe, I say the Yanks have a decided edge. Well, where does all of this leave us? There wasn't much more than a hairline difference last season, and both teams look stronger this year. Man for man, almost anybody would say Brooklyn looks stronger. And I won't be a bit surprised to see the Dodgers win, if they've got the confidence. But the Yankees have won the World Series four times in succession, and I'll string along with old Casey Stengel and his champions until somebody beats them. The World Series had just about everything. Great hitting, uh, great pitching, and certainly the average number of bowlers. Uh, it'll be a long time before anything surpasses that final game. Telesports cameras were there, uh, to bring you the thrilling climax. Yankee Stadium is the setting for one of the most thrilling finishes in World Series history. The Yanks lead three games to two in this the sixth game. Starting for the Yankees will be 24-year-old Whitey Ford. While strikeout artist, Carl Erskine seeks his second series win in this do-or-die game for Brooklyn. The Yanks start the scoring early in their first turn with two men on. Yogi Berra slams a drive into right field that's good for a double, and Woodling scores the first run of the game. In the same inning, the Bronx Bombers load the bases against Erskine. Little Billy Martin is the hitter, and he grounds to second baseman Gillum, who boots the ball, and Hank Bauer registers the tally that gives the men of Stengel a 2 to nothing lead after the first inning. The Dodgers fail to score in the second, and it's the Yanks' turn again. Shortstop Phil Rizzuto lines Erskine's first pitch into left center field for a single. After faking a bunt, pitcher Ford belts a single to right that enables Rizzuto to leg it all the way to the far turn. Next up, left fielder Gene Woodling drives a high fly that Jackie Robinson grabs in shallow left field. But it's good enough to score another Yankee run as Rizzuto tallies after the catch to give New York a 3 to nothing lead. 
After Joe Collins reached base safely, Hank Bauer walks, and as the Yankees load the bases with one out, gets ready for one of the strangest plays of the entire series, with the central figure, pitcher Whitey Ford, on third base. Yogi Berra powers a mighty blow deep into right center that Duke Snyder collars near the 407-foot mark. Hurler Ford, who normally would be a cinch to score, becomes confused, forgets to tag up, and is tossed out at the plate on a fine relay from second baseman Junior Gillum, and the Yanks lead 3-0 after two innings. In the Brooklyn sixth, Jackie Robinson, the only regular on either team not to strike out in the series, belts a Ford toss into the far reaches of left field, and it's good for a double, with only one gone. With Campanella at the dish, Robinson steals third without drawing a throw. Campanella grounds slowly to Rizzuto, and the speedy Robinson crosses standing up with Brooklyn's first run, and it's 3-1 New York after six innings. That's the way it stands as the Yankees' ace relief pitcher Ali Reynolds faces the Dodgers in the top half of the ninth inning. Refusing to quit, the Dodgers put the tying one at the plate as Duke Snyder walks on a three and two pitch. Now gets set for one of the most dramatic moments in all of World Series history. Carl Farilla with the count full blasts a solid smash that lands eight rows up in the lower right field stands for a game tying home run. Duke Snyder ambles home with the second tally as this clutch homer by Farello knots the count at three and three and brings back to life the dying hopes of Flatbush fans. With the lights already on, the tie game goes into the bottom of the ninth. On a three and two pitch, Dodger reliever Clem Labine walks Hank Bauer. With one out, Mickey Mantle taps a high bouncer toward third baseman Billy Cox. That's good for a single. And as Bauer takes second, he represents the potential winning run for the Yanks. Line pitches cautiously. But hustling second baseman Billy Martin wraps his 12th series safety, a smash to center, and Bauer crosses the plate like a wild horse with the run that gives the Yanks a 4-3 victory and an unprecedented fifth consecutive World Series title. Manager Casey Stengel thus becomes the first pilot in baseball history to bring home five world championship teams in succession. Hi, everybody. This is Tommy Henrik again, bringing you your weekly look at the action, features, and personalities from the sports world. It's all ready for you, so let's roll it. Here they come, the world champs, the first club in history to win the title five times in succession, the New York Yankees, who have just gone through their favorite routine beating the Brooklyn Dodgers. Here are our owners, Del Webb and Dan Topping, flanking the series hero, Billy Martin, whose 12 hits tied the record, including the blow that finished it off. Yes, sir, it's an historic triumph for Casey Stengel and his Bronx Bombers. Here's where it started and finally finished. And the first crowd of nearly 70,000 pays record receipts of more than $465,000. The Yanks go right after the Dodgers in the first inning. With one run already in, Gene Woodling walks, and the bases are loaded with world champions. Up step Billy Martin in the first clutch. Carl Erskine works on him, then fires one over, and Billy pulls it far over Jackie Robinson's head in left field. Three runs roll over the plate, and the Yankees are off running with a 4-0 lead. That's the way they play. When they have to win a big one, they go in there swinging for a knockout. But the Dodgers battle back against Allie Reynolds. Gil Hodges, hitless all through the 52 series, hammers the sixth inning homer off of the Super Chief. A few minutes later, George Shuba pinch hits a homer after Billy Cox is single. The two runs leave Brooklyn only one behind and finish Reynolds. Johnny Sane is on duty for the Yanks in the seventh, and Roy Campanella drops a bloop single in short left field. Hodges follows with a single through short, and Campy races around the third with a tying run. Zane works hard on Carl Ferrillo. 
but he cracks out the third straight hit, and Campy's run makes it five to five, and still nobody out. Now the big play. Cox tries to sacrifice, and Yogi fires it to third, and Hodges is out on a close call, and it ends the Brooklyn scoring. Now it's Joe Collins' turn. He tags one of Levine's pitches for a homer. The Yankees add more in the eighth, and they get the jump by winning the opener nine to five. It's a big one for Joe Collins. He was hitless last year, too. Now the scene shifts across the river, and all Brooklyn is up in arms. Somebody's been doing their Dodgers dirt. They're two games down, and the fans demand action. It's another record crowd for a Brooklyn World Series, that is. Nearly 36,000 paid. At least Stevenson is among those present, and here we are, right on the job. Carl Erskine, knocked out in the first game, comes right back. If you feel a breeze, it's the Yankees fanning the air. Carl starts right in the pile of strikeouts. Starting by whipping Gil McDougal, Carl gets Joe Collins, and he fans him and Mickey Mantle four times apiece during the game. Vic Rashi gives Erskine a rugged pitching battle, and it's a two-and-two -two tie when Roy Campanella tees off in the eighth inning. Bothered by a broken finger, Campy finally gets all of his weight behind one and whams it deep into the left field seats for the homer that gives the Dodgers their first win of the series, three to two. And this was the game Campy wasn't expected to play after his hand gave him so much trouble the day before. Erskine just keeps mowing the Yanks down. And when he finally fans Johnny Mize for his 14th in the ninth, it breaks Howard Emke's record set in 1929. Now here's new life in Flatbush, and Junior Gilliam gets started on Whitey Ford in the first inning. He bloops one to right, and Hank Barr overruns the ball, and it lands just inside the fine for a two-bagger. Jackie Robinson comes through with a single over second base, and Gilliam scores. The Dodgers get the jump in the game for the first time. A moment later, Duke Snyder lashes one against the screen high in right field. Hodges and Campanella come rushing over the plate on the two-bagger, and Brooklyn has finished Ford with a three-run attack. McDougal finally solves Billy Lowe's for the Yankees after four scoreless innings. Gill drives a home run deep into the center field bleachers after Martin has belted a triple. The two runs cut the lead to four to two and send shivers down Dodger spines. Johnny Sane is called in relief again, but the Dodgers won't be stopped. Duke Snyder connects for a homer over the scoreboard. The Dodgers keep up the attack on Yankee pitching for an easy 7-3 victory and pull even in the series, two games apiece. Four runs batted in by the Duke in this ball game, and he's on his stroke this time. Back in the stadium. The Yankees have won the big fifth game, need only one more, and go to work on Erskine at once. Gilliam's error helps them jump away with two runs in the first inning, and they get another in the second to make it three to nothing. By the ninth, Reynolds has relieved Ford. He walks Snyder, and Brooklyn, behind three to one, still has a last chance. The Dodger bench is restless as Reynolds faces Farello. And does Carl come through? I'll say he does. He blasts a homer into the right field stands and ties the score with this dramatic last ditch wallop. The Brook bench goes wild. The 
but the Yanks strike back. Mantle beats out a hit after Bauer has walked. That brings up that pesky young Martin fellow. He cracks one over second base, and Hank Bauer comes dashing home with a run that ends the World Series. The Yankees win the game four to three, and it's the fifth time in a row they've finished on top of the baseball world. Are they a happy bunch of fellows? Well, what do you think? That does it for this time. I'll be back with more sports next week. No matter where they are, we'll bring them to you. Now this is Tommy Henrik saying so long. Thank you.